Welcome to my channel. I'm Scott and in this video I am going to walk you through the process of valuing Vistra stock by analyzing their financial statements and dissecting their financial ratios so we can determine if it's a buy or a sell. Vistra is an integrated retail electric and power generation company. Its headquarters are in Irving, Texas and it was founded in 2002. It went public in 2016 and trades on the New York Stock Exchange, Mexican Bolsa, and Deutsche Borsa. It is the parent company of TXU Energy, Dynegy, and Ambit Energy. It has been focusing a lot on investing in clean energy. Let's get started with the model. This is a mid-cap company, 8.1 billion market cap. They're trading at 16.87 a share, and they have 481 million shares outstanding. Let's look at the financials. The way you value a company is you estimate the free cash flows into the future and then you discount those numbers back to today's value. That's what we're doing in this video. And free cash flow is cash flow from operations minus capital expenditures. So you can see they've been doing a really good job at growing their free cash flow. It doubled from 2018 to 2019 at over $2.1 billion. It's pretty steady in 2020 at a little under $2.1 billion. Net income is the profit and loss on the income statement. It's revenue minus expenses. And that was negative in 2017 and 18, positive in 2019 and 20. Revenue is a sales for the company, and that more than doubles from 5.4 billion up to 11.4 billion. This is the company's income statement. The top line is the revenue of the sales. Below that is the cost of revenue. These are the expenses directly related to generating the revenue. And the difference between those two numbers is the gross profit. They had their highest gross profit in 2020 at 4.6 billion. Below that is operating expenses. That was 2.8 billion, the highest ever. And below that is operating income. And that's a little under 1.9 billion. It was about 2 billion in 2019. They paid 446 million of interest on their debt, which was lower than 2019 and 18. Then you have other income and expenses which are usually impairments or write-offs. And the bottom line of the income statement is their net income. And that was positive in 2019 and 20, negative in 2017 and 18. This is the company's statement of cash flows. The top line is operating cash flow. That's how much cash the company generates from its operational business. You could think of operating cash flow as net income converted to cash because net income is your accounting profit and loss. It's not actual cash. Their operating cash flow grows each year and it more than doubles from 2017 to 2020. Then you have capital expenditures which are investments in property, plant and equipment. Operating cash flow minus capex gives you your free cash flow. And they had a lot of free cash flow in 2020 so it looks like they paid down a lot of debt that year. They paid down 2.6 billion, issued 1 billion. So they decreased their total debt load about 1.6 billion that year. In 2018 and 19, it looks like they used their free cash flow to buy back stock. When a company buys back stock, this decreases the shares outstanding, making your shares more valuable. They also pay a 3.6% dividend yield. Let's look at the capital structure, 8.4 billion of equity, 9.9 billion of debt. Their 46% equity, 54% debt, and their WAC is 7.58%, and that's a discount rate we're gonna to apply to the future cash flows. We estimated four years of future free cash flows. We also estimated a terminal value, which is all cash flows past year four, that's 39 billion. We discounted those numbers back to today using the weighted average cost of capital. We get a value of the company of $35 billion. We divide that by 481 million shares. And we get a calculated stock price of $72. They're trading at $17, so they're trading at a 77% discount. It's a really strong buy according to the model. Simply Wall Street is even higher than me, they're at $83 a share. 10 analysts priced this stock in the past 12 months and the average price was $22. The low was 19, the high was 28. And this is the stock price the last five years. So it looks like the stock was climbing for a few years. Then it dropped a lot last March and it really hasn't come up too much. So it looks like it's sitting at a really good value. They pay a quarterly dividend of 15 cents. That's a 3.56% dividend yield and they pay out 45% of their net income and 14% of their free cash flow. The average in their industry is a 2.9% dividend. They're above the average, and analysts are forecasting their dividend to grow to 4.3% in the next three years. 
They have a beta of 0.88, so the stock moves less than the market. It's not too volatile. The stock has gone down 11% in the past 52 weeks, while the S&P 500 went up 47%. The 52-week low was 16, the high was 24. The stock is trading below its 50-day and 200-day moving average, so it seems to be on a downtrend. About 5.5 to 6.5 million shares are traded each day on this stock. Almost all the shares outstanding are on float. 96% are held by institutions. About 1.5% of the shares on float are shorted. In the past year, this stock has gone down 10%, while its industry went up 58% and the market went up 59%. In the past three years, this stock has gone down 22%, its industry up 56%, and the market up 68%. Analysts are forecasting their earnings to grow 19%, its industry 24%, and the market 17%. Analysts are forecasting their revenue to decrease 1%, the industry to increase 7.5%, and the market to increase 9%. In the past five years, their annual earnings grew 73%. That's really impressive. Whilst industry decreased a little bit, and the market increased 12%. In the past year, the earnings on this company decreased 31%, the same as its industry, and the market increased 13%. If you invested $10,000 into this company when it IPO'd and you reinvested the dividends, you'd have $13,400 today. That's a 6.68% annual return. The biggest shareholder is Vanguard at 9.5%, then FMR, Brookfield Asset Management, BlackRock, and Boston Partners. Let's look at the financial ratios. The average P.E. in the market is 33, the median is 22. P.E. is stock price over earnings per share. To calculate earnings per share, that's net income over shares outstanding. They're at 12.8, so investors are paying $12.80 for $1 of earnings. Their price to sales is 0.7, that's a really good price to sales ratio. Price to book is 1.0. And the way you calculate price to book, it's stock price over book value per share. And book value per share is equity over shares outstanding. Equity is assets minus liabilities in the balance sheet. They have 8.4 billion of equity, 3.3 billion of tangible equity, since they have 5 billion of intangible assets on their balance sheet. They have a 7.4% return on invested capital, but that number is lower than their weighted average cost of capital. Their interest coverage ratio is 4.2, ROE of 7.6%, that's about the market median and their current ratio is 1.1. They have 3.4 billion of current assets, and their current assets are 1.2 billion of receivables, 400 million of cash, and half a billion of inventory. So the company does seem to be well capitalized. They had 2 billion of free cash flow, 400 million of working capital, and they paid about $300 million in dividend payments. So they have 2.2 billion of funding. So to summarize, I have them trading at a 77% discount this company has been really growing their business really well. Their revenue and their free cash flows are moving in the right direction. They also pay a pretty nice dividend, 3.56%. So even if the stock is flat, you're getting that dividend payment. I ranked their free cash flows, revenue, and ratios 8 out of 10. So let me know what you think. Give this video a like, subscribe, or comment below. Also, if you'd like to get a custom valuation or just support the channel, you can become a member by clicking on the link in the description below. Thanks for watching.